Welcome, everyone. So, welcome. This is the latest of the, um, what are we calling it? The Showcasing Digital Scholarship Lab series. Um, and uh, so, over the semester, we've been uh, having the faculty and speakers coming in and discussing and demonstrating the ways in which these digital technologies are transforming research and teaching. And, um, and especially, you know, with a, with a wall like this, exploring the way that visual communication and data visualization and all these sort of uh, disciplines are, are, are really changing the way that we're approaching um, things that may have been approached in a more textual way in the past, uh, now can be done in a more interactive, visual, visual manner. And so this, is, this series is all about sort of exploring the implications of that. And, um, and today, we are grateful to have um, Evan Gregg, Gang, and he is going to be talking about uh, uh, a software package that he's architected um, called uh, Reveal, and um, been used by Brown faculty and many other faculty in many sites around the world, I, I gather. So, um, so next, I'll just give you a quick preview of the next couple of upcoming uh, talks. Uh, next week on Thursday at this time is going to be um, Jill Piper, who's professor, professor of uh, mathematics here at Brown and the director of ICERM. She'll be delivering a talk on some form of mathematical thing. Um, and uh, yeah, and after that, is it, is it Andy Van Dam Andy after that? And then the tool building talk. Right. Yeah. Andy Van Dam will be here on the, the Tuesday after that. And finally, it'll be Sean Greenley, right? Yes, on Sean the second. Which will be, he's a RISD professor and will be showing off, I think, some, um, some of the video art that he's been developing, especially for this space, and I imagine discussing some of the implications of that. Okay? Cool, so. thank you. So, I'm Eben Gay. I've been involved in 3D visualization and particularly visualization of archaeological topics for a number of years. and. Three and a half years ago, I got brought in to work on the Reveal project, which had been running for probably a year before that. And the, uh, if you give me the next slide, I think it talks about the team. Um, yeah, in 2008, uh, David Cooper and, and Gabrielle and uh, Ben got a grant from the NSF to do some really creative work to bring visualization technology out of the lab and get it out to actual users in the humanities. And the first year demonstrated that academics are excellent at developing cutting edge things, but not so good at the uh, grinding work of trying to make it into an actual end application. Since my background is in software development and doing archaeological visualizations, I was a natural person to bring in. And I came in with a, another engineer, and we spent three years creating Reveal. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? <coughs> On the team were the, the professors here at the engineering school, also uh, Donald Sanders at the Institute for Visualization of History, Andrew Willis down at the University of North Carolina, uh, Katerina Galore, an archaeologist here, and then there were a serial group of engineers working on it, uh, ending up with John Bellum and me turning it, getting it out the door. We were trying to build a general purpose tool for being able to visualize information for people that don't have a strong technical background. We decided to pick, well, we, you guys decided to pick archaeology because it's a very natural fit. Archaeology is an interesting science where you destroy the thing that you're interested in by digging it up and removing it. Once it's gone, it's gone. So you want to record as much information as you can. Uh, and then afterwards, you want to be able to go back and access that information again. Very often, you're working in really inhospitable, in, in, inhospitable environments. You're up on the top of a mountain in Peru. You're somewhere in the desert in uh, 
well, Turkey, um, Israel, or off on a, a lava flow in Iceland. I mean, just places that, that are, they don't have good power, they don't have good access to cell phones, they don't have uh, places to, to plug in your network. They're, it's very often hot, dusty, or wet, or cold. Basically, you need to have systems that will survive in hospitable environments. And could you back up for a moment? The state of the art at the time, a few people were starting to use databases, but a lot of people are still doing this on paper, partly because that's the way it's been being done and partly because it, a pencil always works. Um, the other problem is each site is unique. They, each site has its own data, has their own way of recording it, and so walking in and saying, here is a solution for your problem, only works if that solution can morph to actually match the way that the end users are, are using their problem. And the users that you're talking about are experts in their field, but their field is ancient history, not computer technology. So this has to be a system that can be picked up and used by people who really know their stuff but don't have to learn our stuff. Um, and finally, the whole purpose of the exercise is publishing. And the, the reason that, you're go that an archaeologist goes into the field is to be able to write it up and get it out there. So whatever system you create has got to be able to support that. So a really interesting set of challenges. Okay. So we started off by saying, down in a trench, you really don't want to have a computer. You want to have something as durable as possible. There are companies out there which are putting a massive amount of effort into making phones and tablets into nice, ubiquitous tools that you can take anywhere. So that's what we want to use for our input, is some sort of a web-based device. So we started off saying, it's got to be web-based. One of the really cool pieces of technology that we're able to leverage that's just been coming out in the last few years is the ability to record things with, by taking uh, photographs with just an ordinary camera and then turn around and build an accurate 3D model just from those photographs. Which meant that we could take the, the technology from, I've just shoveled off some dirt, I see a thing, I'm going to sketch out where it was in my notebook, to I'm going to take a series of photographs of it and then pass that off to the computer to build an accurate model of all of the space. Because when you're digging something up, you get to a rock. Aha, it's a rock. OK, I recorded it. What I didn't know was that after I remove that rock and go down further, there are a whole series of additional rocks. This is a wall. And if I knew exactly where this previous rock was relative to those rocks, I could tell whether the wall crumbled due to age, got knocked over by an earthquake, came down in a fire, or whatever. But that previous rock is gone because I just took it out and tossed it on the pile. So what we can do by taking these 3D models is not only do we have a 3D model, but we know precisely where that 3D model was, was found. We can bring back the 3D model of the rock and the 3D model of the rocks below it. And now you can see the whole thing in three-dimensional space. So basically, your vertical element becomes time, and we can replace that with, with space. So that's really cool. Um, let's see. So the first half is, is recording it. The second half is analyzing it. You've got all that textual data that people entered in. It's this big. It's, it came from this period. It's at this level that we put onto a web form and got typed in. We've got the photographs that people took. We've got these 3D models. And from that, people are going to try and draw conclusions. They're trying to, to find out, OK, in this entire site, where were all of the iron artifacts found? Where was the broken pottery? Where were the, the, uh, the pieces of glass? Because from that, you can start to build up an idea of how people used this space. And then you can start to, to, to go back and forth between asking questions and making inferences. But that only works if you can really easily pull up that information. And so we set out to build a tool that would, very, that would let you very rapidly get the relevant pieces of information out of the database and onto an appropriate display format. An appropriate display format might be a 2D plan. It might be a table that you've filtered for just the information you want. It might be the 3D space. But we want to be able to get back and forth between them all. OK, next. 
So I'm going to explain reveal by walking through some examples. And we're going to start off with what I think of as a normal excavation because it's what we built reveal for. Uh, just going out into the field, digging down, finding stuff, and analyzing it. Then I'm going to talk about some of the more interesting spaces that, that people have used reveal for, such as uh, a very early human structure built in a lava tube in northern Iceland. And the kicker of lava tubes is this is a complex three-dimensional space. You're talking a cave. You're not talking a nice flat building. I mean, most people who build cities build them on a nice regular grid. And if you dig it down, I mean, maybe it's on a hillside. But a cave is this complex three-dimensional structure. And accurately recording the inside of it with just a tape measure is hard, if possible. And the nice thing about being able to build 3D models is that that accurately records this complex space. And the nice thing about doing it with a photograph is you can carry a camera across an ice field and down into a cave and up into the space. And uh, it's a whole lot easier to set up and use than a laser system. And it's a whole lot cheaper. Um, turns out there is a small drawback to that. You also have to haul a generator and a bunch of lights. So it's not as easy as it sounded. But anyway. Um, Another example of an on the edge of the envelope uh, application that people are using this for. At Cornell, they have a large collection of cuneiform tablets that have to be sent back to Iraq, according to the State Department. Uh, it's questionable as to whether they'll be accessible once they get to Iraq. They'll certainly be harder for researchers to get to. Um, and I won't mention that some shipments have gone back and just disappeared. We'll talk about that. But the, the, they're trying to record them as rapidly as they can in as much detail as they can. So uh, they're experimenting with using Reveal as a way of recording these objects. Because the people who wrote in cuneiform, um, if you're writing on paper, it's nice and flat. You can stick it in a scanner. That's great. The people who are writing cuneiform were writing it in damp clay. Uh, one of the common things that they wrote it on is a cone. A cone is you can take a picture of it, and you've only got just a little piece that's in front that the text goes all the way around. You can put on a flatbed scanner, you've got the same problem. The system that we've got, where you can take photographs all around it and then generate a model, nicely captures all of the information and then lets you spin it in space afterwards. Uh, thank you. So the first space is Tel Es Safi. Uh, excavated by Aaron Mayer. This is, was my introduction to, to going out into the field. It's hot, it's dusty, it's not a place you want to have a computer. Uh, we started off doing a single test square there, uh, and, and theoretically that's going to expand out this year. We did all of the, the standard, we, we tested all of our standard process, and next slide please. And the Part that is critical to making 3D work for, for practical application uh, is being able to geolocate it. People have been making 3D models of archaeological sites for quite a while. It's really, really cool. You take a laser out. You can make a, a very accurate 3D model. And you come back and go, I've got a 3D model. And people go, nice. Now what? Until you, if you're trying to actually understand an archaeological site, an archaeological site is all about data in context. So the whole point of Reveal is being able to not just create 3D models, but to put them into geolocated context. So we started off by doing a scan of the overall area, and this is located by survey marks. So we know where this is, we know exactly how big it is. Then as you excavate an artifact, you locate that relative to the larger model, and now you know exactly where that is in space because it's accurately aligned with the larger model. And the, the end result is as you excavate down and as you find artifacts, each of those artifacts can be placed in its accurate relative position and, and display. We'll, we'll show that later. Next slide, please. Apollonia Arsuf was a very similar excavation. It had one additional interesting piece. Next slide. In that this is, a, a number of things have happened at this site, but the, uh, the largest structure here is a crusader's castle. And 
they built it on the edge of a cliff because it's a beautiful defensible position. Nobody's going to sneak up behind you because they have to climb this cliff. The kicker is that the ocean's been nibbling away at that cliff, and it's now further inland than it used to be. So some of the castle is now piled in lumps down at the foot of the cliff. Uh, this is actually the one wall of an inside hall, except that now here goes down several hundred feet straight. The hall is gone. Uh, we were able to build this model by actually standing on this little narrow piece of floor that's left with a camera and going along like this and then feeding the, the images into the computer and it was able to, to generate this model of the inside wall. And you can now stand and look at this wall the way nobody's been able to look at it for a thousand years because of the 3D model. Now, the theory, and we haven't done it yet, we'll see if it happens uh, this year, I don't know, uh, is that we'll be able to make accurate models of the pieces and then in the virtual space try and pick them up and figure out where they went. <coughs> be really cool if we can get that to happen. Next slide, please. Search Shalir, and I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong. Can you pronounce it better than that? OK. Um, as far as I can tell, everything I've seen written in Icelandic, I've heard somebody say it, I've looked at it written, and I've gone, OK. I, so I don't do Icelandic at all, I'm sorry. But uh, Kevin Smith from, uh, from Brown was documenting the cultural remains there because Apparently, they're uh, initially from about 100 years after humans first got to Iceland. And at the time, this lava tube still would have been warm. And it would have been hot, and it would have been dark. And there's a strong suspicion that this was, I mean, there's basically the foundations of a building, but no reason for having a building because it's, it's in this cave. So probably. Uh, it was some sort of a place to worship gods or something. I mean, it makes, I can definitely see it being a, a totally hellish space when it was initially found. But since then, it's gotten colder, and uh, that area got snowed in, and the caves were basically protected by the fact that the entrances to them were covered over with snow. More recently than that, uh, there's been a road put into the general area, and the snow's been melting off. It's getting warmer. And so tourists are now able to get up there. And as a result, they're going in saying, hey, this is cool, moving the rocks around to be more comfortable to sit on, picking up the, the artifacts. And things are, are very rapidly going away. And so th what Kevin was trying to do was to make an accurate model of what this complex space looks like. Uh, yeah. Next slide, please. Now the, this is basically state of the art for recording an archaeological site. And this is what we're able to do from the photographic models. And uh, Merdad here was on the, the trip this last summer building these things. Basically, what you're looking at is here is the actual three-dimensional space, which makes a whole lot more sense when you're able to dynamically rotate it. And here are where the individual objects were found. And we're going to actually get into a demo in just a little bit. Next slide, please. Now, I've been talking about how inaccessible and uh, difficult to work in archaeological sites are. This one is way the heck out in Massachusetts, uh, just south of Boston in a baseball field. So, trivial to get to, but the, the, uh, it's one of those typical things where they started building the Little League fields, and as they were digging, they were turning up all sorts of Native American artifacts. So then the question was, uh, how big a, a site do we have? Can we excavate for the fields? Are we destroying something critical? So they did a survey excavation. They laid out a large grid, and they dug little half meter squares little down at, at every intersection point to find out what was there. And as it turns out, there used to be a factory on a good chunk of this, which destroyed whatever might have been there. So the ball fields are fine. And all around here in the woods is where the, the interesting excavation is going on. Next slide, please. Uh, this was where 
we started to hit some of the, the challenges on the tools that we're using because the, <coughs> the cool thing about building 3D models with photographs with Reveal is that it will work with just about any camera. It's able to work backwards through some nifty math to figure out where the camera was and what its lens characteristics were and all of that. <coughs> but with an ordinary, inexpensive camera, you don't have the resolution if you're just walking around a pit like this and taking images to be able to resolve the fact that that little brown, tiny lump right there is actually a, an artifact. Now, I have to say that uh, this was a, I'm, I have a very difficult time actually identifying an artifact when I see one for the, from this site because there's a burial site uh, uh, further down the stream and this apparently is where they prepared the materials for the burial site. So what they were basically doing is, is cutting stones and, and creating uh, artifacts and that kind of thing. So what you find here are tools and fr fragments that were chipped off. To me, a fragment that was chipped off looks a lot like a broken rock. And a tool in this context is another rock that was chosen because it was a very nice size to use to chip something. So it looks a whole like, lot like a rock with one end being sort of worn. So somebody who's able to go out and say, this is a rock and this is an ax, it's like, OK, I'm glad you can tell that. Uh, there isn't enough resolution on these images, for, on these 3D models, for us to tell that from the 3D models. Now, there is a solution to that, and we'll talk about that at the next site. The other problem that we ran into is we've been saying you can do this with almost any off-the-shelf camera. And the answer is that depends. Typical engineering answer. Uh, <coughs> with an iPhone, you can go out to a site in Israel and you can take photographs of uh, a piece of architecture and build a beautiful model of it because the, the sun there is nice and bright. Turns out that the sensor on an iPhone is about that big and when you get into a dark room and you start, or under the trees in a dark hole and you start taking photographs there, you end up with a whole lot of electrical noise because the sensor is not very big and it doesn't do dark very well. And you need a camera like that gorgeous Canon there to, to really do justice to, to, the, 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 uh, to get the images that you need in order to be able to build a, a decent hole. What happens is you end up with low level pixel noise and the computer program goes along putting the pixels together and it ends up with something that looks like that, which is interesting but not useful. So anyway. So we learned some things at this site. Next one, please. This is the project at Cornell. It was led by Donald Sanders with the Institute for Visualization of History. And uh, it's the Department of Near Eastern Studies run by David Owen. We went up to photograph tablets. We photographed uh, 271 tablets over a period of three days, recorded them, photographed them in order to be able to record them in 3D. We're still running the models. Um, next slide, please. Typical, this is actually a fairly large one. This is the 3D model from something that is literally the size of a postage stamp. Um, it is a piece of clay that a seal cylinder was rolled across. And one of the things that's really cool about this process is if you have a camera that can take images uh, with enough detail. And we rapidly determined that for the larger objects, a regular camera would work fine. For the postage stamp sized things, where P I'm absolutely amazed that somebody can sit down and write on a postage stamp sized piece of clay and actually record a whole lot of information. But the bottom line is you need to have a camera that's got a macro lens that's designed for photographing really close. Luckily, we had one. Uh, so we were able to, to take fairly accurate recordings. And we'll play with the 3D model for this uh, shortly. Next slide, please. I want to talk a little bit about Reveal itself. Uh, the, the intent was to have a web-based data entry, uh, to have uh, a data analysis that would run on a laptop or a PC because it needed the horsepower to be able to display the 3D models and the centralized database and then there is a, a server that runs in the background that grinds the photographs up into 3D models after you've submitted them. Okay. 
web data entry, I talked a little bit about how every site is unique. We basically built Reveal from the ground up to have a set of standard internal tables that Reveal uses for its own housekeeping, and then all of the data tables are completely configurable. Create them in as many as you want in whatever, whatever fields you want, whatever relationships you want, and uh, then set up some config configuration tables, and, the, and that will drive building the web forms and will drive the analysis side. The 1.0 release, it's halfway there. It requires a fair amount of expertise, somebody who actually understands database structures and that kind of thing. I am in the process of building a user interface that sits on the front of it so that you can basically describe your forms and that will drive the, the data in the back. Uh, next, please. Uh, the photo to 3D, basically you, you take a series of photographs following the process that we've described drag and drop them on. Next slide. Uh, queue them up to, to run. Next slide. And behind the scenes, lovely series of pieces of software pulled together from really creative people in a number of different locations, including Brown. Uh, it goes and finds significant points on each of the photographs and does exactly the same thing that you would do if you were sitting there with a pair of them. It says, okay, here, here's a handle, here's a corner, here's a, a dark spot, here's that same handle and corner and dark spot. This one must be taken from here and this one must be taken from there. Computer figures out where the cameras were. It basically places all of the images around the object in three-dimensional space. And then it starts shooting a ray through each pixel in each image looking to see where they cross and saying there must be a three-dimensional point there. So it builds up a cloud of all of the points that define the object. And then it, then it lays a surface across all of those points and you end up with a, a representation of the object. One of the questions that people ask is, so what resolution do you scan to? Because if you buy a laser scanner, it scans at a specific set of angles and it has a specific resolution for depth. And that is the resolution that it will scan to. This scans to the resolution of the photographs you took, which means that if I go to the Grand Canyon and stand on the rim and take a whole series of photographs, I can make a 3D model of the Grand Canyon where, because each pixel maps onto like five meters on the the other side of the wall, where the resolution is pretty low. Or I can take a postage stamp sized cuneiform tablet and a, a macro lens, and I can take photographs all around that, and I can get something which has tremendous level of detail. So the answer is it's based on, your, on the, the, the photographs you take. Not only that, it's dynamic. I can take an entire wall walking across at a fair distance, and then I can walk up to a gargoyle on, on, a, on the roof, assuming I can get there, and take details around that. And the model will end up with a low resolution for the wall that I don't really care about, and high resolution for the part that I do care about. It's, it's different from anything else out there for digitizing. Next, please. I talked a little bit about geolocating. And this is basically talking about the same thing. You have survey points on the, the large area and you build a, a quick model of the, the sp overall space you're working on. And then you, you take the, the excavation area you're working on and you build a model of that. And you align that with the larger model. And then when you are taking, when you find an artifact, you, take, you build a model of that which has points that overlap the excavation area and you align relative to that. And the end result is you're, be able, to, you're able to tie your alignment back to your, your overall site. Uh, and basically our results are as good as your alignment is going to be and we have recommended pro, uh, procedures that involve using, basically pinning either a flag or uh, a ping pong ball or, or an appropriate thing that will show in both models and give you points that, that you can align to. Next please. Um, revealed data analysis, I'd like, like to actually walk through, how are we on time? I have, I'd like to walk through a demo of using Reveal. I put these slides in in case this wasn't running and then I discovered what a gorgeous space this was and wished I'd actually come earlier and installed directly on the, the hardware because stepping sideways for a moment, 
The thing that's cool about Reveal is that you can look at several different kinds of data. Uh, you end up with lots of windows and, and having to fuss which ones are in front. This wall actually would be able to spread them all out on the machine. And I want to try that someday, but not today. So I've got Reveal running live here. And just want to talk a little bit about aligning things here. We've got a couple of layers stacked on top of each other. I've got the drawing for the site. And I've got a satellite photograph. And basically, it's very similar to the kinds of layers that you'd find in Photoshop. And I can zoom in on a particular area. And what makes this fun is that I can just say, OK, show me all of the artifacts that are in this particular area. All right, now let's go and uh, modify this. I want to see just uh, the, the Byzantine artifacts. And OK, these are the Byzantine artifacts. I can hover over it, and it will tell me what it is. Or I can say, all right, let's see the, the photographs associated with these artifacts. And it will bring up thumbnails of all of the photographs. And I can click on a photograph, and I can say, open the photograph. And we can get in, get the, the photograph, and, and take a close look at it. Uh, I can also, from here, do the same kind of thing and say, all right, show me all of the data associated with this. Actually, it's going to be uninteresting because that's just the one object. There we go. Show me all of the, the data associated with the, this object. And I thought there were more objects than that. Yeah, there we go. And show them here. What's happening is on any of these displays, I can select a group of things and get any of the related information about that object. So I can say from here, all right, I want to display this uh, in, as icons in 3D. And this is my 3D window. The difference between it and the, the 2D window is exactly that it gives you not just the, the view down, but by being able to tilt it, you can look and see because in archaeology, the, the vertical position is typically uh, acts as a time axis, as long as people weren't digging holes or, or otherwise messing around with the, the archaeological record. This tells me that these are the most recent things, and the, the lower things are the, the older things, which you cannot get easily from looking down on it in 2D. And this is one of the things that's really nice about 3D. The other thing that's nice about 3D is that I can get, I can bring back my objects uh, that were excavated at different times. This wall was excavated first, and then this pot was found later. But I can now bring them back and see them in context and see exactly where this pot was relative to the wall, even though if you had been there at the time, this wall was gone by the time this pot was found. So looking at them together, I can say, this looks like Perhaps it, there was a kitchen here, because we actually found a row of pots all along this wall. So it was either a, it was, uh, they weren't large enough to be storage vessels, so it probably wasn't a pantry. It was probably a working space. Uh, I'm not an archaeologist, but that's the kind of, of conclusions that you end up being able to draw. Now there are. I, can do the same questions in, in here that I can do in, uh, in any of the other spaces. I can say, OK, I want to know about the data for, for the particu these particular objects. And I can go directly to the data. And I can go to the photograph. So no matter what you're looking at, you can immediately get to the, the related information that's in another display. I can also, if I'm looking up here, I can toss this display back onto the plan browser and see where objects were found in the plan. So I can go, I can start off in the data browser, and I can go and say, OK, I want to do a query for artifacts uh, for a particular period or not. Um, 
I can go and look for all of the, for everything related to the Byzantine period. And I can look at it directly, or I can say, okay, fine, these look interesting. I can also sort, I can sort this by pottery, I can sort it by type, I can sort it by anything, that, any of the columns that are here. I can go and I can add and remove columns. Now, one of the interesting things about putting information into a database is that internally you have information scattered across a whole series of different tables. If you are a database person, you write queries that go across all of the different tables and pull together the relevant information. That's not something that your typical archaeologist is going to, to have understood. They will have, have basically stopped listening somewhere back at the table. Um, this system, because it has the configuration structure underneath it, knows how all of the, the information is related. So I'm looking at artifacts, but if I also want to show area information, I can check off the fields that I want from the area information. I can get what basket the artifact was placed in. I can get what locus it belongs to. I can get what square it was in. And I can get information about the, that square. Anything that, that I think is relevant to a table that I'm trying to put together, I can bring in those fields, and they'll show up here. Uh, I don't know. Let's just add the, the position that they were found at. Now that I've got that information here, I can, I can rearrange the columns, I can change the titles on them, and I can also export this so that I can then use it in the publication document that I'm going to use. Go ahead. Was there any of those different floating objects on the 3D scene that you disputed? What's, the, what's which? The meaning. Um, basically, when I, cre I started this off by creating layers of things that I found interesting. So over here, I started off by uh, collecting, actually, if we look over at the side, I actually started on the plan browser when I put this together. Uh, all of the layers that are on the plan browser show on the side. Whenever I, I change tables, it's, it shifts over to whatever, uh, it, it shifts these over to whichever display I'm looking at. So right now, this, uh, basically, I've got Byzantine artifacts, I've got, uh, some ju what is this? Series of artifacts that I collected. I don't even remember what the the, the common theme was. I suspect that those are all pottery. Um, those are all Byzantine. This is an individual artifact. It is a bowl. Uh, I sort of threw together some some rapid queries to produce some interesting looking stuff. But essentially, if you were doing this seriously, you would say, OK, I want all of my metal from a particular period, and I want all of my glass from a particular period, and I want all of my pottery from a particular period, and then I want to do the same thing for the next period up. And I want to look and see how these uh, layers are placed on the, the, the site over time. Now, what gets interesting about that is in the plan, you start to be able to draw some inferences. But when you're looking at all of the pottery, you don't actually know where they were found unless you go and get the, the individual depths for each one. But if you come over into the, the 3D model, you can turn it sideways and see that, yes, these are all pottery and potentially all from the same manufacturing period, but they clearly were not uh, buried here at the same time unless somebody was digging a pit and throwing in uh, their trash, which is possible. Uh, I have to say, the more time I spend with archaeologists trying to figure out what's on a site, the, the angrier I get at how poorly it was that people left the archaeological record. It's very confusing. Um, and then a badger digs through it and screws the whole thing up. Just uh, anyways. Um, but the, the, the point is that from here, it's hard to tell what, what time periods the layers were found at. It looks as though these are all related, but when you look at it sideways, you can, do, you can realize that, that actually they're spread out. At which point, I would probably, if I were seriously trying to understand this, I would probably select these into uh, the data browser and try and see what was common to them relative to what was common to these. And I'd probably put those in a separate data browser. 
So now I can start doing comparisons between the two different groups and figuring out why they were actually buried at different layers, even though they look as though they all belong together. And this is the, the uh, and then I'd probably start doing things like looking at the photographs of uh, of these relative to the photographs of those, and and basically you can very rapidly get between all of your different data modes uh, without having to stand back and do queries or uh, perhaps hire a grad student to spend six months going through your data and, and, and making plots and charts. Um, one of the, the strengths of Reveal is its tight integration. On the flip side, there are tools like GIS systems, which do a beautiful job of laying things out uh, on 2D plans and are able to do much more sophisticated queries than you can do within Reveal. So what you can use Reveal for is a way of collecting together data that you want to plot out in an external system and then using it to actually export the data as CSV files of data or as collections of photographs or whatever is relevant to your external system so that, that you can then go into your external system and, and start uh, exploring it in more detail in whatever system that is. For instance, we did not put a charting and graphing package into here because it's so easy to export one of these tables into Excel and do your charting and graphing there in Excel. Excel is at that. Um, other questions? I didn't decide anything. Basically, we took photographs and from the photographs built this model. The part that's here should actually get trimmed off, and I haven't gotten around to doing that. Uh, and that actually is one of the <sighs> strengths and weaknesses of this uh, process of doing models from photographs is that you get the object and you also get the, the space right around it, which gives you context, and it clutters up the space here. So, yes? So maybe one question is that 3D model which I constructed with respect to the group of images. Yes. How do you register that with the map? That was back a couple of slides. Can we go backwards on this? Right there. Uh, basically, what we did. This, this slop beyond the edge of the object is critical to being able to accurately register this object relative to what's around it. Because we, when we've got a photograph of the area, and then we have, a, then we have this, the photographs that built up this model, we take the, the model with this overlap, and we take the area with its space and we basically lay the two on top of each other and use that to align them. And the alignment process is mediumly cumbersome at the moment. Uh, we, the reason that we recommend putting uh, uh, tags or ping pong balls or whatever into your space is that if you have a series of tags around the wall of the, of the excavation and those tags show up here, you drop a marker onto the tag in this model and the tag in that model and Reveal says, okay, and snaps them into alignment and scaling. If you don't have that, then you have to look at, look for interesting rocks and roots on the wall and matching rocks and roots and it's a pain in the neck, which is why we recommend putting in, in tags and markers. Uh, at this point, it is a uh, semi-manual process in that you have to, to tell the system where the tags are and then it will do the alignment from that point. Um, one of the minor additions that's going out into the, the update that, we're, that this is the beta for is uh, being able to export this model, easily trim off the external stuff, and then bring it back in and pick up the alignment it had before so you don't have to go through realigning it. It's, uh, uh, um, 
minor series of steps, but it makes a major difference in terms of how things look. This demo data is from the 1.0 version where we didn't have that feature yet. So uh, I should run through the database and, and clean, clean it up. Yes? You want to say a few words about how to use this platform to do other things, such as <coughs> Andrew's hassle reconstruction? That's actually a really good point. Can we flip forward in here? Keep going. I, I had a whole bunch of slides in case this didn't come up, and this is running beautifully so, on so here. The point is, this is a platform where you can build all sorts of applications on it. Right? The, there are two points here that, that are important. One of them is that I mentioned before that Reveal has the tables that are specific to, to an, its internal stuff, and then the, the, table, the tables for data are completely user configured. My wife has been strongly suggesting that I should set a set of tables up for my office so that I could find things in my office, but that's a separate issue. That basically, the, the reveal system is completely data agnostic. So anything that you can represent, uh, anything that, that has positions in 3D space and where it would be useful to be able to go back and forth between tabular data and photographic data and 3D space, uh, reveal can work for it. We used archaeology as our first uh, <coughs> sort of target discipline, but there's nothing specific to archaeology within Reveal. Um, and the second point was Reveal is a growing product. We can get, next slide, please. Um, OK. Did I miss it? Is there, there should be a slide in here talking about future stuff. Um, no. I may have accidentally dropped the slide. Keep going forward and see what happens. Is there another one after that? No, nope, guess not. OK. Um, looks like I dropped a slide in the process. The, the, one of the things that I wanted to, to point out is that Reveal is, is growing. There are uh, additional projects in the lab that we would like to incorporate into future releases, like uh, the stuff that Andrew Willis has been doing it at UNC, where basically it's a procedural way of doing an artist representation of the site. You can define your ashlar blocks and found it. Great. Where did I hide it? It was hidden. <laughs> okay. Um, GIS in integration will be in within a month or so. Um, the improved customization is going to, to be in before the end of July. Um, Further out in the future, we've got some fragment assembly software where we basically digitize a whole series of pottery fragments, and it sits down and tries to figure out how to build a pot from those fragments. Right now, we've got some constraints. It needs to be a pot that's, that's got a, an axis of symmetry and some things like that, but that's looking really exciting for, for the future. Uh, we were talking about the process of laying all of the fragments out and then trying to figure out which ones go together. Hopefully, we can speed up that process. Um, we're looking at being able to take video and drive our 3D models from that. One of the things that people have been asking for is being able to take one of the little quadcopter UAVs and fly it around a statue. We've got somebody who's actually looking at buying uh, a system to take out into the field this coming summer to do exactly that in uh, Sedan because they have some 20-foot high <laughs> statues that are just impractical to digitize, but they could fly this little gadget around it. So those are the kinds of things that we've got coming in the future. The castle is a beautiful example of the, the <coughs> procedural process <laughs> for building a, a model from a description. The, the theory being, if you're trying to do a reconstruction, you're basically talking about an artist's reconstruction, and it's a sketch. And it looks cool, and it lets you visualize what the place looked like, but you can't draw any, you can't then process that image and get any uh, hard data from it. Uh, if you build a 3D model, it's as good as what the 3D modeler was able to do, and some of them are phenomenally good. But again, you, but if you want to make a change to it, the modeler has to start over and make those changes again. Uh, 
if you want to draw conclusions from it, about all you can do is, is walk through or fly through it. By doing it procedurally, you can, you can say, well, we found that, that it was built out of blocks that were about this big. Uh, let's define a wall as being built that out of blocks that size. Let's say, let's spec out how long the walls were. Let's say that we think the towers were probably about this high for this particular castle. We'll define a tower structure and then the, the system will generate it. You look at it and go, we didn't find that much rubble. I don't think it was that big. Tweak it down and generate another one and be able to very rapidly do first off, rapidly do representations without having to have an expert in place to do it, and then be able to start drawing conclusions from that about the volume of material and such like, and then cross-check that with what you actually find on the site. So it, let, it does, lets you do some really interesting uh, analyses. And yes? I wonder how the cave would look like, especially that you utilizing the Z Okay, this is just the, the uh, one of the two cave spaces, and yeah, that's what I get for trying to do this on the fly. The fun thing about doing a demo with beta software is, yeah. It's even more fun when you've got saved applications from the previous version of the beta that isn't quite compatible, but let's ignore that. Okay, so here we've got the cave space and we've got uh, the individual objects in it. And We should be able to back off and say, let's change over to layer separation. And now you notice we've got artifacts floating out in space. These, there are 3D models that are around these artifacts. They're just a different set of 3D models. It's a different part of the cave. Um, So if we split out the layers by z-axis, this I think I'm answering a different question than the one you asked. We have a number of different display modes, one of them being I mean, basically all of the artifacts were found on the floor of the cave, so that they're all in one layer. We don't, have, we don't have much time information associated with that because the cave floor is not soft. But uh, one of the modes that you can flip reveal into is instead of showing that the absolute spatial position of your artifacts to be able to split out the layers by uh, it vertically. So this allows you to do the kinds of, gee, I wonder how things uh, moved over time. Now, this is not a very interesting set of artifacts to do that with, but by being able to, to tip the display, sometimes you can get, uh, by being able to separate out the, the, the layers by an artificial z-axis, uh, if you've got something where things moved around over time, it now becomes a vertical spiral. And you can actually see the, the, the way that habitation moved around in a space uh, as a, a, a three-dimensional spiral in, in space, which is uh, really quite pretty. Um, another thing that you can do along those lines getting completely away from the question you were asking. Uh, let me switch back to the previous, demo, the previous database. T 
typically, when you've got a great deal of, of activity that's taken place in one location over time, you run into the problem that all of your data piles up on top of itself. So it can be difficult to determine where the artifacts are. In this case, the artifacts are fairly well spread out. We don't have a lot of overlap of things on top of each other. But one of the things that we can do is just to do a simple scrub of layer transparency so that you can, can switch back and you can scroll through your layers and see where they are, uh, see them individually. But because you're, you're able to do this dynamically, you can uh, put together a mental map for, for where things are located. It's just, it's one of the solutions. It's, it's another alternative for being able to understand your data. We've just started to explore some of the options for what you can do for representing data in two, in two dimensional space and three dimensional space beyond just the, a literal position representation. Any other questions? We have brochures about Reveal here if you're curious and want to take one. And it is an open source project. The uh, beta kit is up in the, the file space on SourceForge at the moment. It will become the final kit after the, the beta victims have gone through and, and found anything that I've overlooked. I already found one thing. Uh, it's actually pretty solid for, for a beta. Can I do for you? It is open source. Open source, okay. And uh, Patrick can attest that the install is pretty straightforward. Um, we did it a few minutes before we started. Um, pretty straightforward. Anything else? Well, I have to say, I'm really looking forward to putting some serious data onto your base system and then being able to take this and spread it out across your entire wall. Because I think that would be amazing to be able to actually look at all of your pieces without having to, to be managing what's showing and what's not showing. So this, this looks like a really cool space to, to take advantage of. Thank you. <laughs>